Um, so this is kind of related to Utsa's question, but not at all. So you spoke about um, someone having the statistics that our threat of extinction is 20 to 40 percent in the next 100 years, 50 percent. All of that is horrifying. Um, I won't mention the nuclear power plants that are in the war zone don't, in don't mention Russia those. right now. Or people, the are, people are not mentioning a lot of things, right? <laughs> I, I <took laughs> There's a lot my, of not mentioning going on here. <laughs> I took my cue from James. He's I good at helping. <laughs> or, you know, the, the starvation that's impending because of the supply chain crises and the, all of that. So, you know, so I do want to know how to save the world, which you're talking about every minute of every day. And also what I'd like you to speak to is the way that we as a mystical society can sort of st stay closer in to to this the depth that we are um, entering into to affect um, the field. Beautiful, beautiful. And I think that was two questions, right? Oh, right. But no, I got it. it, was good. it was good. No, I got it. I got it. I got it. So <laughs> it's two great questions, right? And, and massive, massive blessing and healing. And I know you've been struggling the last few days, right? Yay. Yay. So Taylor asks two questions. Christine asks two questions, which are both actually critical. We'll, we'll talk more about the second one tomorrow. And it's how do we actually hold, you know, quote unquote, the, the mystical society, the political mystical society? which is critical. It's a beautiful and an important question, but, but let me go to the first one. And, and I want to say something if I can, you know, gently, you know, I mean, really gently, really with, you know, quivering, with quivering tenderness. And, and I actually said this to KK, right? right literally right before we, we left the room. It's very difficult to actually engage the urgency of the moment. It's just hard, right? It's hard. And the moment is urgent. But the, the way to engage the urgency of the moment, and, and it really is, and, and I appreciate, Christina, you bring it to, to the fore, is trembling with joy. Right? It's trembling with joy. And, and, and I think we, we mentioned it this week, Right? It's very, very easy to say basically, and that's actually what 99% of even the best people do, is you know, the very few people that are actually facing existential risk, most of them are facing it as a hobby. It's a very sophisticated hobby, right? It's very, but it's kind of a hobby. It's like, oh, right, I'm in, I'm in the existential risk conversation. Right? But it's not a hobby. Right? And to get the reality of it, as we said this week, and, and we felt it in the silence in the room at the end of Don't Look Up, which was, you know, but the barest illusion is horrifying. And yet, we have to rejoice and we have to celebrate. And if there's any quality of consciousness that we want to actually hold here, is that capacity to, to, on the one hand, really act audaciously. I, I, it's time, right? You know, I said to, to one friend of mine today, if we go at that pace, I'll be dead. And we all will before we get there. So there's, there's a time where we need to be wise. We need to be wise. We need to be appropriately strategic, whatever that means. And, and we need to have a kind of radical audacity. All right, so I want to just tell you a little story if I can. There was a dude named Peter Berkson, right, who's an unknown hero. He's one of my favorite human beings. Peter Berkson's original name was Hillel Cook, K-U-K, -K, and he was the nephew of the Cook that we've quoted here. Okay? Peter Berkson comes to the United States in 1941. And David Wyman, and if you want to read one insanely important book, right, read a book called, I'll give you two. There's two like insanely important books. One's called The Abandonment of the Jews. And it has nothing to do with the Jews, although it happens to be about the Jews. It's called The Abandonment of the Jews, written by a, 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 a secular Christian from Massachusetts named David Wyman. And it's an incredible chronicle, right, right Walter, of how politics works, right? And so Peter Brixen comes to America, 
And by the end of 1941, we have clear information, I mean fucking clear information, that there are death camps. Without question, right? We know that's true. And between 41 and 45, right, five and a half million people were killed. And just, I want you to hold this for a second, and even the fucking Jewish leadership, which cared insanely about this, these are their cousins, right, was so careful to be appropriate and not to rock the boat and not to make, to offend the Gentiles. That's all of you, by the way. Just to get that right, 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 right? And so let's, let's not offend anyone. And they, they walked very carefully, and Peter Brookson comes to America, and he says, fuck this. Right? And the entire Jewish establishment tries to close them down. Right? So he's coming there to try and get Roosevelt's attention. He can't get Roosevelt's attention. He becomes friends with Eleanor Roosevelt and some strange quirk. He holds against all the Jewish organizations tried to stop but holds a rally in Madison Square Garden. He gets virtual death threats. And all he's trying to do is say, stop the slaughter. And literally... And the people in the Jewish organizations who are trying to stop them are great human beings. I don't, these are not devils. These are fabulous people. But they're watching out. Am I looking good? Right, what will my parents say? What will my brother say? What will my sister say? What will my uncle say? Right, and Arthur Morse wrote a second book called Well, Six Million Died and about how people politicked right, to make sure they were okay while fucking mothers walked in with their babies in their arms and got gassed. Whoa. So if you want to know a little bit about my early childhood, you just got a piece of it. Like, wow. Then Samantha Power wrote a second book. And Samantha Power was also another person who I've never met. I've never seen a picture of her, but I have a crush on her as well. Right? And she's fucking brilliant. And she wrote a book that I read four times in 2007. I read it again and again and again. And it's called A Problem from Hell. Genocide in the 20th century. She became Obama, read the book. She became one of his top advisors. She married Cass Sonnenstein. Different conversation. And she goes through the seven genocides, meaning utter destruction of the people in the 20th century. And she goes through the State Department cables right, and how you should deal with each of these genocides. And she lays out a panoply of seven possible options from boots on the ground, meaning invading, to economic sanctions. What are the seven possible ways you could effectively respond to seven different genocides? Let's forget about the Jews for a second, right? The Armenians, right? right? You go through all seven genocides. And basically, she shows that the State Department of the United States right, did not take any of the seven options, when you get this, in response to any of the genocides other than Kosovo, Right, when Bill Clinton bombed Kosovo because his opponent, Roger Dole, made it a campaign issue. I want you to get rivalrous conflict based on win-lose metrics. Right? And, and, and Samantha Power became Obama's top advisor and got neutralized in the White House. Different story. All right, but basically, she writes this book about how literally... Right, people adopt a rivalrous conflict, win-lose metrics. What will advance my career? And how will I actually navigate this and try and do a little help on the side? Fuck that. Like, fuck that. Right? I mean, in other words, we actually have to be able to act. Now, yes, we need to act wisely. And yes, we need to act strategically. And yes, we need to take careful steps. That's all true. So I'm not, I'm not talking about a kind of rash, you know, action that actually backfires, but actually we need to have audacity, right? And we need to take it seriously. And I know and I apologize insincerely, right? But I do apologize. I know it's hard to hear. And I know it's impolite. And I know it's not cool. And I know all of those things. And I know this is the person that, at the party that you kind of look away from and say, I want to talk to them. Let me go talk to somebody else. Right? So I get that. And Christina's right. I want to just say something about Christina Amelon. 
one of the things I actually said to Kika I love about Christina Amelon is she takes it seriously. Right? Right? She, Christina lives in Madison, Wisconsin. She started a business, and she, she managed it, entrepreneured, and created a, a beautiful world. And then she realized, okay, and we started talking, and, and she, she takes it seriously, which is beautiful. And you got to be in radical joy. And you got to celebrate. And you have to have great dinners, right? And you have, you have to kind of be in the full eros and joy of life at the same time, Right? So this is, it's this, 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 this is the essence of this whole week, this, right? right? I can't fix the world, and I can't liberate the world. I can't heal the world right? unless I'm willing to already live in the world that's already fixed and healed and liberated. So I've got to live from that place of joy. Right? And maybe the last sentence, permission, and the second we'll talk about more tomorrow, but KK came into the room, and she said that... Um, Shimon, it's that guy, right? <laughs> that guy, right? So that they, 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 we did a bunch of interviews today, and we're we're trying to make a um, a trilogy of movies. We'll we'll see how that goes. But Mad Blessing, and the first movie is actually about KK's story of her own sexual abuse and how she went through a process of healing. And I I met her at the end of that story, and we did a, a whole piece of work after she'd done an entire journey of healing. And then the last third kind of is how KK herself then kind of met the Dharma and how, how things unfolded. And KK was very, very generous and in, in actually in she's been working on this for 25 years and kind of offering her story because her story actually can actually be a Trojan horse that opens a door into culture. Because right? it's actually a, it's a very, very critical and important door. And we hope to go from there to kind of, kind of the new renaissance and kind of and that whole story. And so KK was doing it, some of you, and thank you for all the people who showed up and, and did interviews about kind of how, how, how you met the Dharma and how the Dharma impacted you, and whether you're new or, or you've been here for 10 years or we've been hanging out together or, or how you experienced right, the, the embodied right, dimension. And then so KK mentioned to me that Shimon talked a little bit about Israel, right, which was uh, a, you know, a huge piece of my life, right? And... And, you know, Kiki said to me that she asked Shimon, how did, how did he feel when, when it kind of, it all, and there was a certain moment, right, based on an injustice where it, it actually fell apart. And, and Shimon said that he did the thing that, that the Hebrew custom is where you rip your garment when there's been a death. And it was, it was a great shattering. And I said to KK, right, I mean, right, I said to KK, I'm ecstatic that I'm not bitter. And I'm really not bitter. And I can't take any credit for it. I've tried to figure out many ways of taking credit for it. I've worked it really hard in my mind because I wanted to take credit for it because it's such a great thing to take credit for. But I actually can't. It would be idiocy. That was her greatest gift to me. I'm not bitter. I'm actually kind of ecstatic and delighted to be alive and, and insanely delighted to be here and insanely delighted to be working with you to change the source code. It's very easy to get bitter. Bitter doesn't work. And tell you that's critical. Bitter doesn't work. A fierce anxiety that traps me and paralyzes me doesn't work. I've got to look at my grandchildren and be ecstatic. And I've got to, you know, right, you know, hold myself. And I've got to self-pleasure. And I've got to, right, read. And I've got to, right, right, I've got to be in life fully. And from that place, turn and face it and act with radical audacity. And my hope, my prayer is that what comes out of this room is a radical audacity, right? A radical audacity where we take bold moves, right? Where we step out of the ordinary, right? And that's not easy. It's not easy, right? And it's uncomfortable. And I, I said to a friend of mine in the United States, last sentence, and we'll, we'll go to the, we'll do a l'chaim and go to the next song and, and the next question, that I sent to a friend of mine who just sold a property and you know, bought another property in the United States and supports us. And, and I mentioned this earlier in the week, and he got a little bit mad at me, which I felt a little bit bad about, but people get mad at me all the time, so it's, I'm kind of used to it, right? And I apologize in advance because everybody's right, right? But I said, like, I said, like, you know, brother, you know, someone I've known for 15 years, I said, you know, for you, existential risk is a hobby. 
I'm just, and I said, let's just say the shit that you're never fucking allowed to say. You just spend $2 million on a new house and 50000 on existential risk. I rest my case. Really? That didn't go over that well, by the way. It just didn't, wasn't, it wasn't, just, I wouldn't advise doing that ever again, <laughs> right? But the point is, we gotta fucking take it seriously. And it's not about money, it's about time, right? So KK, right, Christina Tahel, right, Claire, Shahati, right, and, you know, David and, and 30 other people in this room, Krista, right, they, they've actually, right, there's lots of people in this room, a couple of dozen, who spend their lives on this. They've staked their lives on this. There's a couple of dozen people in this room who stake their lives on this. Right? And they impress the hell out of me, I gotta say. They make me cry. They impress the hell out of me. They, they've taken a stand. So that's, that's the crazy invitation of tonight, right, of this whole week, is take a stand, and you know how to do it. And resources, whatever your resources are, time, energy, commitment, creativity, but for fucking real, Right, to really step in, and you can tell I've drunk a little bit, so I apologize, right? This is a glass of wine, right? But it's really real. It's a real deal, right? It's a real deal. So thank you. Thank you for that question. We'll talk more tomorrow about mystical society. And again, right, and this is a sincere apology. If, if anyone found that offensive, I completely, really do apologize, right? L'chaim! 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 L'chaim!